maintenant donner la parole euh, au docteur euh, Egon Eve qui va donc nous parler d'esthétique de, euh, obtenue par la gestion des tissus mous et par la, la phase prothétique. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to, to be here and to share my fresh experience uh, with the Antogir uh, Axiom Implant System and uh, I will talk about optimizing the pink interface in, uh, in modern implantology. After the bone we, we have to talk about soft tissue as well and this is important, it's the framing around uh, our uh, restorations um, and I will talk about this, the pink interface the soft tissue, also about the hardware and design considerations and also about some failures and complications we encounter in uh, our daily work and last but not least I will uh, I hope to give you the recipe uh, how to work with the Axia multi-level uh, multi hardware and also how to use on a, in a critical way the protocols we all know how to do a post extraction case etc etc so let's start with the biologic building stones beside the implant we have the bone and the soft tissue and I try to obtain uh, high end aesthetic work so we work with bone soft tissue adjacent teeth also the prosthesis is important hardware but also the interfaces in this pink part we have in three to four millimeter millimeter three different types of tissues and up to four bioprosthetic interfaces so it's really important uh, to realize how can we divide uh, and how can we develop our emergence profile within this few millimeter space we have. So to start with the bone, bone as you have seen is important, bone is necessary to have anchorage for the implants, it, but it's also our soft tissue framework. It provides anchorage for the teeth, the implants and the muscles, also the muscles have a role, but when we lose the teeth we lose the volume of the ridge. But we are lucky, we can recreate, as Jérôme showed us so nicely, uh, the, the missing bone. And I will take you on a trip, a patient, patient's journey. The name of this patient is Daniela, uh, an Italian uh, young lady. Uh, she was a dental assistant, not in my office, but in the past. And in the year 2008, she came to our clinic and she wanted to get a treatment for a failing bridge and she had some peri periodontal problems, papillae, black triangles, there was some chronic inflammation in this area for instance and the bridge to missing premolars started from the canine on this side. Now this patient is a little bit a problem because she has a high smile line and high aesthetic expectations. The best way to treat her probably is to refer her to another dentist, but I had to do the job. And this is how she exposes her teeth at rest. And this is a medium smile, and you see already everything. The papilla problems, missing papilla. And this is the bridge starting from the canine to the molar. Two missing premolars, a big concavity, a big sinus with two septum. You see the second, the molar is not the first molar, but the second molar tilted forward. So we have different uh, problems. You see the angular bony defect. This tooth needs uprighting. We cannot do that orthodontically because of the dense bone structure. And on the canine, we also have two problems. There is a missing interdental bony peak. We have a cratering, so missing papilla support. And we have also 
a proximity problem. Over here, you cannot pack a cord and make an impression of the two. So the plan is to place two implants and to make four single uh, tools restorations. So two on the natural teeth and two on the implants. So this is after the surgery. I did horizontal augmentation, bone augmentation, and sinus elevation, placed the two implants, and I treated the perio part up front as well. So this area has been treated. I grafted bone uh, to rebuild the interdental bony peak between the canine and the lateral incisor. So here we are. You can see the volume of the bone augmentation. And he, here we are eight months down the road. And you see flat mobilization also creates another problem, a mucogingival problem. So we have missing keratinized tissue and the tissue is very thick, thin. So it has been, uh, it stayed thick only at the palatal margin. So I used a membrane to do this augmentation. So it's a non-resorbable membrane. I had to remove it, but I doubled the width of the ridge and I was satisfied with the result of the, the bone augmentation. Then I went to the donor site in the palate find a thick piece of tissue, make two very small perforations, and I place them on these modified healing abutments. Also, the buccal portions, you see the modified healing abutments, concavities, I have more space for the soft tissue, and the buccal part is de-epitalized, so I can suture the other part of the flap buccally. So the whole package is gonna give me a boosted biotype, thick tissue is a must. So that was uh, in the healing period. Then I do an analysis of the tooth proportions. I want to restore this case with golden proportions and the reference tooth of this patient is the left central incisor. It's a 10 to 8 proportion, height, width, and that means that also the canine in the area where I'm working should be as high as the central incisor. But I'm at 11.7, so the canine is more than a millimeter too long. And here I decided to treat this case with an additional orthodontic treatment, a fast orthodontic treatment of three months only to extrude this uh, canine to make it shorter. Hopefully also some of the bone would come down with the extrusion of the root uh, and the tooth. And also the tilted midline could be corrected. And here in the frontal area with the central incisors, I could obtain an improvement. So you, you see a small overlap, small recession. And that what, that's what the orthodontic treatment did. So you see the brackets, the canine is kept out of occlusion uh, all the time and it came down uh, just over a millimeter. I can rearrange a little bit the contact points with the orthodontic treatment as well, so it's all beneficial for the papilla, especially over here. So um, you see, this is my regenerated interdental bony peak, extrusion pulled everything down, and now we have the harmony back in the case. Look at the symmetry between the central incisor. So, oh, uh, it was quite a lot of work, but I was satisfied with my end result. Metal-free restorations are in place, single tools restorations, two on the implants, two on the um, molar and the cane point and this was four papilla problem black triangles and this was now my end result so th three out of four were resolved so the problem was fixed only one the most difficult papilla was not there yet it is the papilla between the implants which is very difficult to uh, to, uh, to get back. So um, three out of four, that means in Italy, the patient will ask you 25% discount.
But for me, that papilla was not so bad. I mean, this is her smile and it improved a lot. So overall, everybody was happy. Look at the central incisors. They were splinted. So it was a, a quite a long treatment of 18 months. Patient was happy. Uh, this is before the treatment. And this is when I presented the bill. <laughs> Oh, I'm just joking. <laughs> the problem is, you know, I have to give guarantee on the on what I do and on my work, and I pretend the same from my dental technician, and you see her the the restorations under the restorations. That's more interesting. We have two flat to flat uh, two. Implants is a flat-to-flat -flat connection. We have six soft tissue, but what about the bone? Let's look at the bone. I started with the pre-surgical bone volume, then I did the grafting, but everything is protected under, under a membrane. And after the removal of the membrane, a remodeling process, process is triggered off. And you get development of the biologic whiz from this moment on, so eight months after the grafting, this bone starts actively remodeling. The, so this is my zero moment. If we wait a couple of months, you get establishment of the biologic width, and if we go by the book, every year we should lose maybe one-tenth of a millimeter of bone. This is from the Brennemark literature. So this should happen with this patient. Um, but let's see what's happening after the uncovering. This is the flap I did to create thick soft tissue and I removed the membrane. On the buccal side the tissue looks quite thick, but there was some necrosis over here. Not so much, but the, I had a period of a one month with thin soft tissue, it grew back a little bit and this was enough for me to develop the emergence profile for my restorations. So, here, zirconia abutments, the restoration cemented, and now you suddenly see on the X-ray, after eight months, we have some bone loss, because the bone was definitely higher. What are the reasons for this bone loss? And this was what I questioned myself time after time. Well, there are many reasons. We have newly formed bone that can be resorbing and remodeling. We had thin soft tissue, multiple changing of components. I was taking impressions and I did a lot of uh, modifications on my provisionals. Then I had to do uh, uh, cementation. There was a flat to flat connection. And of course, you can have poor oral hygiene that can create some bone loss, smoking, stress, the list can be longer, but I think we all agree it's a multifactorial thing. This is why we lose bone sometimes. But especially the connection and the, the contamination is a problem, because if we have crystal bone loss and an exposed rough part of the implant, the color of the implant is outside of the bone, we can get infection along the emergence of the implant, and these are stepping stones towards peri-implantitis. Now, this is exactly what happened after four years with this patient. You see, I have the flat to flat connections, pus is coming out, I try to uh, correct this with antibiotics, with disinfection, a uh, new technique of flossing. But one year later, after a, a, a small improvement, the thing continued, the probing increased, I had more pro bone loss, and my bone defect was getting wider and wider, and I was afraid also for my first implant on the first premolar. So, to make a long story short, I took the decision to interfere and to take my implant out of the bone. And here you can see the contamination of this implant. Very strange to see that the pathway of infection is not like a straight line, because here we have infection, we have two threads 
still integrated and a third thread with bacteria again. So the bacteria can go through the bone like through a labyrinth sometimes. And this is interesting and this is why it's so difficult to treat this disease. So I waited three months after the removal of the implant and then I placed a, another implant slightly deeper with uh, some bone regeneration under a membrane, resorbable membrane. And I took an implant flat to flat with a smooth collar. So this was now in 2013. Just before I came to Paris, I made, I'd make this x-ray, you see. My first, my new implant is doing quite okay, although I have some remodeling, but I took a smooth collar. But now look at this area. My first implant is, is getting the same disease. And this is why I did not really sleep very well uh, during the night. So it's a danger. Uh, how can these implants survive better? So the, we have a flat to flat connection. And that was for me a trigger point. You see the first implant now, eight millimeter probing, that's not good. Was a trigger point to do a critical hardware revision. So I was thinking, what can I improve? I do my best, but it's not always stable in time. So my conclusions were that a conical connection definitely brings more stability and a better seal. You see new bone formation on the shoulders of the implant. Also a flat to flat connection. When it's placed deep, it can do damage and you can get crestal bone resorption. And a rough surface which is exposed can be infected and that can develop uh, peri-implantitis. On the other hand, a flat to flat connection higher in the tissues is better tolerated by the body. How is that possible? It's, it's still in the same pink area. So to understand this better, I started to dive deep into that pink interface. And here you can see the hidden secrets. We have here three types of tissue. You can see the implant connection of an axiom implant. And you can see there is a difference in the tissues. From the top going down, we have the oral and sulcus epithelium. Epithelium, histo uh, the histology looks like this. It's very strong tissue, the cells are well connected, it's bulletproof and it's a good mechanical barrier. It's like our skin. So this is the strong area. If we go one floor down, we have a non-keratinized tissue. It's called the junctional epithelium. And here we have more blood supply. It's thinner, you see. And uh, the body can trigger off an immune defense. And white blood cells can migrate to the surface of the abutment and attack bacteria, for instance. So this layer better should not be disturbed. If we go towards the connection, we come in an area where we have the attachment. The attachment we know well from a natural tooth, and this is quite strong because we have Sharpie's fibers. It's well attached into the cementum covering the root, but unfortunately we don't have that at all at an, uh, at an implant. But we have very weak tissue. It are, it's mainly a bunch of circular fibers, like scar tissue, and you can probe through it quite easily. And so this is definitely the weak link. So I try to keep this area in my abutment design tight and narrow, as narrow as possible. Now I'm lucky with the antogeo connection, which on bone level implants is only 2.7 millimeter wide. So it's very small. And this is how I can emerge through this delicate area. So this is a little bit the biological background in the pink area. And if we put a traffic light in here, the green area for me is definitely the epithelium where we have strong tissue. This is where I like to 
built out my restoration. The delicate area starts with the junction of the epithelium and the red light is the attachment. So why should I make this area so easy, uh, reachable for bacteria? By building very white on top of a very white implant. This gives me, in some cases, the, this, this type of problems. And when the infection is there, it's, it's too late. So, some of them, they do well, but here we have a smooth collar with a flat to flat connection, a little bit away from the bone. This is a bone level implant of a very well known company. But a bone level implant with a conical connection, when you make a bridge, why? Don't I use the conical connection? I place again a flat to flat connection very close to the bone with the resorption we can expect. And so I think this is not a smart design and this is why we normally should use multi-unit abutments when we make bridges, right? We use the conical connection and we place the flat to flat not on bone level but higher up over here. So this looks much, much better, and this is the Axiom PX bone level implant placed deep under the bone, slightly under the bone, you get new bone formation on the shoulders. And this is now what I call a real bone level implant. It gives me biological stability and bone stability, which is so important. So we move from old school implantology to the new school approach. So, if we talk about bone, we would like to pre preserve what we have. If it's not enough, we rebuild the quality of, quantity of bone. What's even more important, it should stay stable in time. This is how we can keep the cases stable, and this is how we can avoid failures and complications, like the ones you see so often in your clinics. We can have different failures, aesthetic, biological, mechanical, operator, dependent, human <laughs> mistakes, or combinations of all of these. Look at this one. One year after placement, a problem, the buccal bone is gone. It's a very big implant. That's also something wrong. We cannot copy one-to-one -one the root with a big fixture and place it against the socket wall. This is a false implant miss. And also, it was an incorrect use of a protocol in this case, because they placed this implant right away after an extraction without doing any type of grafting. So we cannot preserve what there is. And this was the patient sent to my clinic for retreatment. Her name was Tracy, a very nice uh, lady from England. This is the implant, very big. Your right hand side, six weeks later, placement of a new implant and the bone grafting at the same time. So the old implant goes out and you see no buccal bone, a big bone defect. New implant was placed over here, but look how much work it was to, to prepare my soft tissue envelope. I use different tools. On the other hand, on the other side, I do the bone grafting, you'll see. But for me, the first surgery was more difficult. More difficult. You see a big template, a graft from the palate. See bone grafting here. This is deep delization on the margins, just to close the defect with a pouch procedure. And the closure. Bone tags over here are necessary to keep form stability. So a lot of work, but luckily seven months later, you see, I'm removing the membrane my bone is back and it stayed in front of the implant because of the bone tags fixating the membrane. So we can do a lot of work. The preservation strategy 
the first implant failed, reconstruction was okay. The GBR, GBR was very successful, as you can see. The new implant is in place. Then, prosthetic part, the whole planning is important. Three restorations, three surgeries, nine months later, we had gone from here to here. Metal-free restorations, hand-polished by the technician to get the texture right and natural light reflection. You can hardly tell that these are restorations. So, five years. Survival, stable pink interface, as you can see in this picture. So, we can fix the problems, but my first goal is to avoid any problems and I'm very critical now on my hardware I'm using. And on the protocols, because sometimes we make a big mistake. We try to adapt a patient to a protocol. I think we should adapt the protocol to the patient the other way around. And we know we lose bone after extractions, so it is not good not to graft. So we went from graftless to grafting. Here, a German group publishing that incorporation of bios can help us to limit some of the shrinkage, but still in the light blue color, you see we lose some volume. That little bit of volume can be compensated with connective tissue grafting. And you see here, it's also useful to keep the grafting material in the socket and the bacteria out the socket. So, we try to use these studies to work on a patient like you see here. A very thin biotype, a 22-year-old girl, referred to my uh, little clinic and I discover that her mother is a famous lawyer. Not so happy with that. Here you see how big the problem is. I have to do my diagnostics. The socket wall is still intact. I do the probing of the buccal bone and then I decide I can take out the tooth and place an implant simultaneously because my buccal socket wall is still there. And now I graft. I graft the demineralized bovine bone, so that's bio-os, mixed with autogenous bone from the drills and then to compensate the blue color, the missing volume, I use a graft, a mixed graft. Epithelium in the middle, deepitalized on the wings. So the implant is placed not in the center but more palatal. I graft the buccal area and then I know I will get shrinkage, so I don't want to, my soft tissue to collapse and therefore I will make it thicker by placing this graft in the area like this. So the two wings go in a palatal and a buccal pouch and in the center I have the epithelium and this gives me the illusion of a root. Four months later I take an impression, this is a healing abutment and I use a provisional to build out my buccal profile. So this is how I like to develop an emergence profile in small steps. By using composite, modifying my provisional, I find the right shape of this provisional. You see it over here. It looks beautiful for a provisional. And then in the end, it's just a matter of copy and paste. I want the same shape on my final restoration, so I take a customized impression coping with the same emergence profile as my provisional and I send all the information to my lab technician and he makes now the perfect copy of my provisional. Zirconia based monoblock restoration and it really looks like a tooth. I like to make teeth. I don't like to make crowns. Uh, you, it should be the illusion of a real tooth. Still with the old school connection, still with an emergence profile going white. And 
imit imitation of a tooth. I call this a transversal emergence profile. And this is how it looks. X-ray. You can still see some of the biomaterial. But I was proud. I went from here. I thought about the mother of the patient to here and it really looked so much better and there was no difference in the, in the shape. It's only the color and that's, and it really looked like a natural tooth. So that made me feel very proud. I cracked the code. I know with this protocol I can do the cases. And the same night I went in internet and I order this t-shirt for myself. <laughs> I start to walk a little bit different, and my shoulders became a little bit wider. I was really proud. But four years later, I take a picture again, and I see in this particular area, there was some liquid coming out of this interface. And this is not periimplantitis. This is mechanical irritation. Why? Well, when I started probing, I started feeling some rough surfaces and I went deeper and deeper and deeper. It became quiet in my treatment room. No of the assistants was talking anymore because this is what I discovered. Not nice. I lost all the buckle bone and this is how I felt. <laughs> and I buy a new t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we try to learn from mistakes. And you see, three months, I, I'm missing a lot. And why did this happen? Now, I had a theory and I was convinced that I had taken out a tooth which was standing a little bit outside of the ridge. So it was the protruding socket theory. Because in a socket, there's always a weak link. That's the buckle bone. Uh, the buckle bone is called bundle bone. That's the weak link because it's not protected by cortical bone. And as hobby is my photography, I was able to take a nice high magnification picture of bundle bone. You see, this is a root with some bundle bone still attached. And do you know what this is? Blood vessels. Bundle bone takes the blood supply from the periodontal ligament. It's full of fibers, it's of periodontal origin, and this is why we lose it so quickly after an extraction. So if the bundle bone is only buckly in a small area, it does not matter so much. If it's wrapped around, around the, the root, like this one, the socket is still there, but it does not give us the protection we want. You have this situation. So maybe better to place the implant more palatally and choose a smaller implant as well. And this is the difficult one. Uh, the cells cannot migrate fast enough, buckly, because the bundle bone will disappear. You see that over here. and. This is why we graft also on the outside, if we have a situation like this, or do first the extraction, wait five weeks, and place the implant later. Early implant placement may be better in these cases, because then what is gone is gone, and you can regenerate what is missing, like I had to do after four years. So the implant was gone, healing was complete, now I place a smaller implant. I did the grafting from the nasal spine. Now I pick a bone level implant. I was working with, the co with a company telling me, oh, you should try one of these bone level implants we have, conical connection. And this is the conical connection of a very famous implant on the market. But is this the right design? Is it clever to have a cover screw covering the neck of the implant, not only the connection, the, the whole neck. It looks quite white, this connection. But let's see what's happened. I have now my regeneration. I still use membranes, some biomaterial. 
bone tags seven months later the bone is back so i'm bone tags membrane i have a bone level implant covered with bone and here we have a shift in hardware we go from a big flat to flat implant to a smaller conical connection implant as you see which is placed also deeper supracrestal placement for the first one and below the bone let's say four millimeters below the gingival profile the second one it has a small platform shift and it's considered an early bone level implant so i i go from the old school to the most common design with a conical connection and we call it a bone level implant because also the Strauman company reintroduced this word in the industry. So let's have a closer look at the conical connections. Are they all the same? We have history, we have literature and I went into it, I studied it. It was invented, the principle of the cone in the cone by Morse and the real Morse taper it has a taper angle of only six degrees. This is very impractical in implantology because the plastic deform deformation of the two parts moving in into each other creates a lock and it's hard to take them apart. So that's not practical. We have a good seal. If we go to white, let's say 24 degrees, we have no seal. The best compromise is the 12 degree. We can still take the parts uh, apart so the abutment of the implant without problems and it's the best practical compromise with a relatively a good seal and then let's let's see how a 24 degree taper performs versus a 12 degree taper and so these these two groups if we draw an implant around it and this is a 12 me, uh, degree conical connection versus a 24. You can see here I have a bigger platform shift, I have a better seal and my implant is stronger because the shoulders are wider, I have more metal around the connection. So this is why my first option was to, to look for a 12 degree conical connection, tighter seal. I stayed away from the bone in this delicate area where I have the attachment. So this was my first approach. Unfortunately, in this patient, I placed a conical connection of 24 degrees. I finished the case, and same side, same tooth, two implants, still a success. I worked hard for a lot of soft tissue, as you can see, but look at the bone. This is a 24 angle. It goes wide very fast. There is not a big platform shift. And over time, this, will create crestal bone remodeling and some bone resorption and I'm not happy with that. Uh, so this is not helping me to keep my bone level stable. This is four months later. So again, you know, a potential danger for peri-implantitis. Uh, it's too wide, too early, not a proper platform shift. So this is why Definitely the better option for conical connection is the 12 degree axiom uh, bone level connection. And we place that four millimeters below the uh, free gingival margin. The whole system for me was an eye opener because it's very easy for diameters to designs the more aggressive PX, the regular, which is a very nice implant as well. The one is used in soft bone. If I have denser bone, I use the regular all the time and I can decide during the surgery because I'm working with one simple surgical kit. And so it's really user friendly and it gives me flexibility. And there's only one connection. This was for me a little bit different to make for instance, a big molar on a 2.7 millimeter connection. And this is also giving me a huge platform shift and a strange emergence profile. You see the platform shift? 
on a 5.2 millimeter, it's really big. And I have now a very narrow emergence in the first one and a half to two millimeter, and then I go wide. This is a molar on a 2.7 millimeter connection, and I call this a bottleneck design. Having a bigger platform shift, is the, if the implant diameter becomes bigger, has been demonstrated it's beneficial and favorable for crystal bone preservation. We have less resorption when we have a bigger platform shift. And this study was done with a flat-to-flat -flat connection of Canulo from Rome. So the conical connection of Axiom performs even better than what you see in this paper. So the 5.2 has an <coughs> implant shoulder, neck, of 1.25 all around. So a very strong implant with a big platform shift. Now, how deep do we place the implant? Everybody in the, this room should have a clear idea. And we already agreed, place it a little bit deeper. If we go by the book, the book says go 0.5 below the bone level. Now, is this really true? I think we should know one more thing. We should not look too much to the bone. If we go in the literature, and the most important studies are of Linkovicius, he says, for vertical position of an implant, we should use a soft tissue reference, not the bone. If tissue thickness is two millimeter or less, so thin tissue, you get crestal boneless loss up to 1.45. So independent of the type of implant you use, you will lose the bone because of the thin soft tissue. And this is why if the tissue is thin, we should place the implant a little bit deeper to avoid that the bone loss we get in this situation exposes the neck of the implant. So remember, 3.5 is the critical tissue height we need to get stable crystal bone. And this is what I use in my protocol. So I start working differently. I always measure the tissue thickness. And then you can do two things. If the tissue is thin, simply place the implant deeper. Or, let's say three and a half, or boost the biotype. And this is what I'm doing most of the time. I place my neck of the implant slightly below the bone, 0.5. And then I boost the biotype. So I measure, I have two millimeter or less. I know I can work with an implant like this one, a TL, but I need additional connective tissue. And this is what Jerome also pointed out very nicely. This open space is so good for bone growing in this area on the shoulder. So here, the only thing we have to do is create thick tissue. This is the connective tissue, and I make a little incision in here, and this is what I call a kebab special because I put it on a stick and I slide it over my healing abutment. And then I close the flap on top of it. And so I get thick tissue. And this is how it looks on the x-ray. But please remember, if you have 3.5 or more, the bone will stay where it is. So this is for me. Uh, a guarantee to keep the bone in place. And this is nothing new. We know the studies from Linde and Berglund, 96, they already said, if you have thin tissue, you'll get more bone resorption over here. So nothing new under the sun. It's an old story. We have now new applications with the Axiom implant concept. So 3.5 to 4. This is again a molar, so I have my anatomical outline. And then I have my 2.7 millimeter connection. I just connect the two, staying within the superficial area where I have the bulletproof epithelium. I don't want to go wide too deep with my emergence profile. And we should not see this as a horizontal pocket, like a furcation but more like a pontic on a stick. 
And so I started thinking outside of the box. This is my bottleneck design. Here we see another one, a molar. Is, the, is this strong enough? Not one abutment has ever broken and, and sent back to Antogia. So the engineers did a fantastic job. It's grade five titanium and it's super strong. And it's strong enough for a molar. And this molar is now developed within the layer of epithelium. And it looks like a natural tooth. It's really big, it's 12 millimeter on a 2.7 millimeter connection. Isn't that amazing? So it's the new way of working and developing and designing our prosthetic immersions profile. So the technician should know to stay away, let's say two millimeters from the bone, and then he can go wide. Don't let him go too close to the bone because we need the space. Two millimeter is the safety zone, and in the other two millimeter, one and a half or two, we develop the emergence profile. So the, the things I told you tonight is that the emergent, the immediate post-extraction protocols, they have evolved. We don't do graftless preservation anymore because we know we, we get a collapse of the volume. We graft the gap in the socket between the implant and the socket wall with BIOS. We use the connective tissue on the outside of the socket to get the original volume back and also to get crestal bone stability. With 3.5 millimeter deep placement, we have a better preservation of the crestal bone. Transversal emergence profile, we don't make it, we make the bottleneck. And this is how we put it in a recipe for the axiom bone level, but also for the tissue level. So we keep the good steps from the past, like the atraumatic extraction, cleaning of the socket, depotalization, placing the right piece of hardware. This is an axiom PX of 16 millimeter. The longer sizes are in the smaller diameters, very clever. We place the implant in the right position, minus four be below this margin. We graft the gap. We put some connective tissue on the outside to get this volume you see here. So we want to create the illusion of a root and a bottleneck emergence profile is now developed with a provisional. Still use the provisional. We do it like this, very funny. We take the ideal shape of the neighboring tooth. We mirror this on the implant and my technician now makes a provisional with a rich lap. A rich lap looks like this. It's a wrong shape for the final restoration, but I use it in the provisional. You see that here? Just to develop and shape my soft tissue. So it gives some pressure, as you can see. It leaves an imprint in the soft tissue. And two weeks later, I start to modify the provisional, like you see here. And now, slowly but surely, maybe in two steps, with some fine tuning, some extra pressure to get the zenith on the right level, and also take some of the material of the provisional, and I leave an, a space open to get symmetry in the papilla area. The tissue will fill this space. The tissue has a tendency to fill concavities, like you see here. That's two weeks later, and now my papilla is very nice. My margin, my buccal margin, it's a little trick I will show you, is made w w uh, thicker and more stable by engineering a small concavity that goes one and a half a millimeter till maximum one millimeter under that margin. So I create thicker buccal margins. In this, what I call an artificial sulcus. And then we copy and paste this on the final restoration just by taking my provisional with the concavity using some flowable uh, acrylic, customizing, personalizing and impression coping. You see that the part above the connection is very narrow. 
the tissue cannot collapse, I have an impression. And this will be filled by the margin. And this is the bottleneck. So this margin, the buccal margin, is stable. This is the tissue of the patient. And this is the model of my technician. So it's a one-to-one -one copy. And this is made with a CMEDA monoblock with an original important use original components look at the little a and the little logo here it's important and also don't polish the connection part this is why you see this dark line above this line everything is polished below this line we should not touch it that keeps the precision in our components and the same shape is now visible and here you have the concavity that goes on under that margin and stabilizes it and so this is again a crown with hand polished texture and it really looks like a natural tooth you see the light reflection and therefore it's also teamwork you need a good technician to finish the job and to make a good looking tooth, not a crown. How do we clean this? You see, this is floss. We go around the tooth, we pull on both sides, we call this loop flossing. So the floss will slide under the bottleneck and clean below the, the gum, the area where we have the epithelium and we don't go deeper. The same philosophy is engineered in the Axiom TL line and so I would say for me it was very refreshing because we all know Antogia is innovative biologic two words biology and lo logical thinking we can work in an aesthetic way it's user friendly and also on top of that value for money so this is how I'm working nowadays exclusively with the Axiom multi-level implant and I did not regret it for one single minute that I switched to the new school type of implantology I tried to show you tonight. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Ivan de nous avoir fait partager cette expérience et surtout de nous avoir montré des cas de compli de complications parce que ce sont les complications qui vont nous amener à raisonner à modifier notre façon de faire. Et encore une fois, c'est la biologie qui permet de changer nos attitudes et on s'aide évidemment de la technique.